Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and I think my laptop is updating so you may hear some background uh, interruption. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. I'm just grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to take and look upon your word, to feast upon it, to glory in your grace. Dear Father, we're thankful for your love, your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace. I just ask that you would filter out any foolishness or ignorance and just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this video, I'm going to be doing some things uh, a little different. Uh, uh, basically, what I'm attempting to do here is something I'm not used to doing. That is, I'm trying to run the laptop camera uh, for the video while the screen recorder is recording my movements on my laptop at the same time while looking at my notes, uh, looking at in, in my Bible, at the uh, passage in which we've arrived at in our study here in Romans chapter 6. So I'm going to be talking a little bit on the side here about a few things to try to drive a, a, a main point home uh, to zero in on what I believe the primary focus is in, in the area in which we're at uh, here where we've come to in our study. Now, I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I've never been known for my illustrations, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, a few things before we actually get into the text that I believe will help support the text and help you better understand the text as we go into it, reading it afterwards. So it's kind of a reverse, whereas, you know, uh, the, uh, what, what seems, to, at least to me, to, to be the best thing to do is to read the text and then comment on the text. I want to kind of do that in reverse, which is also a little different than what I'm accustomed to. So I ask that you bear with me, please, here. Uh, I don't have any narrative. I'm just working off of notes. But this is such an important area of scripture that we've come to that I don't want to be misunderstood on it. Uh, so in our last study, we were in uh, chapter 6. I'd like to focus in on verses 12 through 23. Uh, so that would be 11 verses. And I want to zero in on this one word, yield. Because we're not under law, but we're under grace, yet the word yield is a very prominent word in the text. Uh, so we finally come to a point where that, you know, y'all are going to have to get busy doing something. Probably never thought you'd hear me say that, but that, that turns out to be the case. Now, because we are looking at sin and the law, uh, the sin and law question, both both sin and law, uh, it's it's being addressed here uh, in relationship to that one word, yield. And I think what you're going to find out, if you bear with me through here, you're going to find out, uh, you're going to see some amazing things. Um. So the discussion is going to concern itself with the word yield, and I'd like I'd like for you to, if you can, to highlight that word yield in the text. In any place that you see that word yield, uh, that may be also a good thing to do. I want to start out with an illustration. Uh, those of you who are married, uh, okay, you have a husband and a wife, and uh, in this relationship of marriage, there is sacrifice. Uh, it is a way of life. Uh, you walk or you conduct yourselves in a, a particular manner. 
and it's you could call it a vocation and it's something that was determined and agreed upon by both parties now the point that I want to make here is is a very simple one it is submission to another it is a way of life and when you, when you walk in that certain manner in within the parameters of that relationship certain results will occur if you step outside the parameters of the requirements of that relationship then uh, much different results will occur I think most of you would agree with me on that I want to give you another illustration uh, it's, a, it's a basically a simple one it uh, has to do with gender uh, as a man I live like a man I don't try to become a woman basically and the same would be true the vice versa you know if you're a woman don't try to live like a man if you're a man don't try to live like a woman live as who you are now that's a that's a key point in in what we're going to be discussing here uh, so live like like who you are not like who you are not and or not as to try to become something uh, it would make no sense whatsoever if you were married to try to live in a way as to, to try to become married that, that's just illogical uh, so but because you are that which you are it's it's really a, a simple uh, principle another example would be the military for y'all you, you you folks out there you men and women who've been in the military you know that you submitted yourself to a certain authority uh, in in our case it's Uncle Sam and so you have military versus civilian you were a civilian but you became uh, a member of the military and you live in, and you walk and you live and you breathe you eat you sleep you 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 live as as who you are in submission to that authority and now I understand that at times you know you, you might get a little liberty if, if you were uh, back when I was in there wasn't a whole lot of that for some odd reason but but if you do then you might change into civilian clothes and you, you'll get out of uniform but you're, you're still even though you are dressed as a civilian you're still carrying that ID card you still are you're very well aware of the fact that you belong to a certain authority and if you go a wall well that's bad that's a bad thing I had some friends that did that it didn't turn out too well and so you, you live according to who you are now these are simple illustrations I also want to throw another one out there this is a uh, has to do with really about raising kids we, we a lot can be said about positive reinforcement um, when I was raised as a young child my, my folks always told me I could be anything I wanted to be they they never really told me that I was worthless and that I wasn't going to amount to anything and uh, they, every time I did something wrong which seemed to be quite often they, they loved me despite that <clears throat> and they didn't make that love of theirs conditional on my performance on how I behaved so I want to throw that out there as well positive reinforcement I think the same is true with animals uh, little Coco if, if you uh, who's back in the den here I, I'm trying to keep him out of here he likes coming in here when I'm doing this he, he likes riding around on my shoulder a lot he's for those of you who are, who are new to, uh, to this uh, series of studies and you don't know who Coco is he's a he's a parrot small uh, green cheeks connor and he likes riding around with me and and he he will bite my earlobe 
and sometimes he'll bite me on the cheek and and any and he'll climb up me and he'll you know use his beak to do so and he doesn't know he's doing anything wrong it's just how he is and I remember one time he bit me on the ear and and I, and I looked at him and and he gave me this look back like well what did I do wrong and he doesn't realize he's doing anything wrong he's just being who he is they use their beaks to climb and stuff he's not trying to be me I think the same thing could be said about a horse that I used to have that actually put me in the hospital now nothing Coco is going to do is going to put me in the hospital but this horse did uh, it reared up its its back feet slipped on gravel all 1100 pounds came down on top of me and it shattered four bones in my left wrist the horse didn't intentionally premeditate to you know that uh, that injury he didn't he didn't mean to harm me uh, he was just being a horse basically but the point here that I'm trying to make is is really a simple one and that is at any given time in any one of our lives we are in a certain condition we're either married or unmarried we're either uh, in the military or we're a civilian we're, we're either uh, one thing or another uh, and it, it just makes zero sense to be one thing and try to live in a in a manner walk in a manner if I could use that expression uh, in which uh, we are not believing that we are not what we are now this is crucial to our understanding of this passage because we have come after five chapters of seeing how that we were totally depraved that we came under uh, uh, the umbrella you, you might say of God's loving mercy and forgiveness and grace made righteous justified made righteous in Christ uh, made a new creation uh, to where that we are now uh, in possession of a new man that doesn't sin yet we still have an old man that that does nothing but sin we can either walk according to the flesh the old man or we can walk according to the spirit which is the new man it basically amounts to walking as who we are not trying to uh, obtain uh, some status or some position uh, it, uh, it, in which we are not if you kind of follow what I'm what I'm getting at here now I think that what you'll see on your screen here is where I've contrasted the new man with the old man I want to make it absolutely certain what scripture says here and that is the new man is unchangeable according to 1st John 3 9 whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God when we look at Romans chapter 8 which is just ahead of us here verses 12 through 13 we read therefore brothers we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live now that that verse I could spend weeks on on all of the the nuances of that verse it is by the spirit that we put to death the deeds of the body not by law and that results in life this is an obligation that we have and this is what we're looking at in a sense even though we haven't come to Romans 8 yet we're getting uh, our first glimpse of that right here now I've contrasted uh, well this I, I want to go through this very quickly here the flesh equals old man law keeping is a rule of life and self-dependence all of that that you see underlined at the top all of that is related uh, uh, very directly related uh, it's all combined together into one nice ugly package the flesh is the old man that's what scripture calls it law-keeping 
as a rule of life. Self-dependence as opposed to Christ's dependence. So I want you to look at these verses. The flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. 6. For what the law was powerless to do, and I've got to stop right there, and I've got to say that, you know, it, it's amazing to me. It's, it continues to be astounding that most Christians believe they are under law as a rule of life. When you have Romans 8, 3 beginning for what the, with the words, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Don't just look at flesh as as just as robbing banks and and uh, you know committing adultery or, or whatever ugly sin that you want to you know bring up to describe the flesh. The flesh can be involved in either positive or negative activity. If you're living according to the flesh as a Christian trying to keep the law, it, it'll appear to, to be a, a good thing, but it's really not. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And, and, and this is how scripture really addresses the flesh question. It's not looking at it as much from a worldly standpoint as it is from a Christian standpoint, because that is who you are. And it's written to, to us as Christians. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everla everlasting. So, so you see the contrast being uh, drawn out here. Philippians 3, 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, that is my own ability, my own strength, if, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul said that. It's no wonder he said that. He considered himself the Pharisee of all Pharisees. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Galatians 5.17. Just can't do it. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Romans 8, 12. That's jumping ahead, but this is where we're going in our text. We are debtors. If you're married, you're a debtor to your wife. If you're in the military, you are a debtor to Uncle Sam. If you're a man, you're a debtor to that gender. Are you trying, are you beginning to understand what I'm trying to say? So, under grace, this is where we, we want to start this equation here. Under grace, we have a choice. We now have a choice as Christians. It has nothing to do with the choice of being redeemed. In that, we had no choice. But as Christians, we under grace, we have a choice. And we are given a choice here in, the, in our present text to either yield to one or the other. We're either to yield to the unchangeable old man, which is unrighteousness, or the unchangeable new man, which is righteous. And the point that I want to make and stress here is that neither one is changed by our yielding. Underline that. I can't emphasize that fact enough. Why do I say neither one is changed by our yielding? Because the old man will never change, and, and, the, and neither will the new. You can't, we can't become any more righteous than what we are in the new man. We've been made the righteousness of God. How righteous is that? And, and in the flesh, there dwells no good thing. The flesh profits nothing. And in fact, Scripture clearly declares that the old man becomes more corrupt day by day. There's nothing good in the flesh. And God isn't trying to clean up the old man. This is the, the modern mistake of modern Christianity that believes that God is actually trying to clean up you, the old man, or, or he's kind of leaving you up, leaving that up to you to do that yourself. 
There's nothing good dwells in the flesh. So both are unchangeable, and neither one is changed by our yielding. That's the point that I want to stress right here. That's the point that I want to stress. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That's new man. Holy, that's new man. And pleasing to God, that's new man, which is your spiritual service of, of worship. Actually, the original text, I believe, says reasonable service. It's your reasonable service. God expects that to be reasonable. For we are God's workmanship. Whose workmanship? God's. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. So not only did he prepare it in advance, that is through Christ, who is our life, the new man, not the old man. But he calls it our way of life. It is a realm of existence. And we see this as we go on. Nevertheless, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Not to attain worthiness, <clears throat> not so that we will be worthy. We stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. So he's pleased, and fruit is born. Growing is also occurring in the knowledge of God. So that's where growth takes place. Therefore, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. How did we receive him? By grace. How are we to continue? By grace. We're not born again by grace to live then, afterwards, according to the law. We encouraged you and, and comforted you as we urge you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Finally, brothers, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus, to live in a way that is pleasing to God as you have received from us. This is how you already live, so you should do so all the more. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Now, this is what we're looking at. The question that I have is, which will be our offering, our sacrifice, our manner in which we walk, our vocation, our continuance, our way of life? And which did we receive? Which did we receive? We're looking at the contrast. Flesh as opposed to spirit. Unchangeable old man. Law keeping. Self dependence. Where it is I, not Christ. Which basically amounts to legalism. And this contrasted with a walk according to the spirit. The unchangeable new man fully righteous in Christ, grace not law, Christ dependence, Christ dependence, not I but Christ. So, I wanted to go through that and uh, so that we can then take and, and look at our text here. I'm going to go ahead and read now through the text uh, starting here. If I can go back and I know this is, these are quite a few verses. Well, it's 11 verses, starting at, at verse 12. I want you to take note of everything that I said prior as we go down through here reading this. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness, whether of sin unto death, that's the old man, 
or of obedience unto righteousness. That's the new man. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men. Just keep in mind that the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit. Paul says, I, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded our members, your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness, couldn't do any, any righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I'm going to do uh, something here. I want to, I'm going to take us to the where it's, uh, I believe it's, it's verse 13. This is a, uh, we're going to focus in on verse 13 here for a moment, but I want to look at this in the original text. I'm going to click on enter linear here, and we're going to take and look at the word yield. You're looking at the word yield here at the beginning. Right here, if you can see, I'm not sure if you're seeing what I'm seeing, but I'm, I'm circling around the word yield. And what this is, is uh, this gives you the grammar. This is a present imperative active. We are to, in the present tense, it's a command, actively yield not neither yield the members of you as instruments of unrighteousness so I just wanted you to note the present tense here this would be an ongoing activity this is what we're not to do but we are to yield and this is an aorist imperative active it sees the action as a whole we are to yield Arist yourselves to God as out from the dead as living that's the new man out from the old man into the new man and the members of you as instruments of righteousness righteousness because we are righteous to God now that's about it I don't know really how to better illustrate or better explain the passage that we just read, uh, except to say that it's come. We've come to an area in our study where God is simply, folks, asking us to live like who we are, to present ourselves to Him as how He sees us. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of this marvelous grace that we're looking at. Now, I'm convinced that many Christians will look at this passage and having failed to understand the marvelous grace that preceded this passage in, in, the, in the previous five chapters, that they've become the righteousness of God in Christ. That God has nothing against us that we are called saints, that we've been justified, that we've been made a new creation in Christ Jesus, that the sin issue is settled, that we're to reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Now we are being called upon to live as who we are, not as who we are not. To live in a way which honors God, which pleases God. The only thing that will please God is our living as who we are and it shows just how much we love him when we do thank you for listening this is steve i love you all i truly do gracious heavenly father just seal to our hearts that which is truth 
filter out any error or foolishness. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.